Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming today, and thank you all who are turning in, tuning in from Meridian and Twin Falls and from Idaho Falls. So it has been a brisk seven months since I started, and a productive and very quick five months since last I was up here addressing the entire university. Today, I want to talk about three items. So we're going to do a lot of business today. The first is the state of the university. Where are we now since August? The second is the condition of our finances. I promised this was going to be a lot about budget, and it will. And third, <laughs> once we get finished with that, where do we go from there? So I'd like to start by looking back to August when we met as a university. I shared with you some of my initial observations for being on the job just a couple of months at that time. And I shared with you the hope I have for our future. And now I'd like to provide you with a few updates on some of the things that we discussed. First, we discussed launching a search for a new everybody. Vice President of Finance and Business Affairs then, so we could begin the work on the future of our finances. So today I'm excited to announce that Glenn Nelson is with us and has joined the Bengal team as our Vice President of Finance everyone. and Business Affairs. Glenn, thank you all where for are you? Coming Stand up. And thank you all for tuning, tuning in from Meridian and Twin Falls and from Idaho Falls. So, it has been a brisk Glenn seven started last Tuesday. Started. He's been here eight and days. Productive and very quick. <laughs> So Glenn has already hit the ground running, addressing the and entire university. knowing our financial situation, Today, he's probably already been run over a couple items. of times while running, so we're going to do a lot of business. He probably stopped, wondered what the heck he got himself into, but then he started running again. And we've had lots of productive conversations, and in just a short time, I've been impressed by his leadership skills, his listening skills, and his commitment to doing things right for the benefit of our students. So I'm excited for all we can accomplish together and confident where he's going to take us in the future. Now, last August, I also started mentioned I was going to start a Coffee with Kevin program. This has been a great experience. I've talked with so many of you. I've heard a lot of our challenges, challenges that you face on a daily basis, the things that impede your ability to serve our mission. But more than that, I've heard your passion. I've heard your commitment to this university. I've heard it come through in those conversations. I've heard your dedication to our students. So first, let me say thank you, all of you who've come to those sessions and had those visits. There are so many things we can work on and yet so many strengths we can capitalize on. For example, one of the things that has come out of Coffee with Kevin is I have heard your concerns about travel. I've heard it from faculty, I've heard it from staff, and I've heard that we have a travel system that is an administrative hang-up and it's time-consuming. And it's not about the people who work in travel, we have great people in travel, but it's the system we put them in. It's the policies and processes and the overall philosophy on how we approach travel. So the number one item, the number one item on Glenn's list is to address the travel system. Now. Is the travel system the most important item we have as a campus? Well, probably not. But a couple things about the travel system. One, it is something we can fix. And two, maybe, maybe it actually is important because it demonstrates something. First, that I'm listening. I've heard what you've had to tell me and we're going to work on it. And second, it demonstrates that we are going to approach our employees with a new level of trust and respect. So we're right now going to begin working on the travel system. We also launched our One Thing campaign where you sent me ideas and there were so many that came in we established a group dedicate, of dedicated people to look at these ideas and see how we can make headway on them. Now for example, we found that faculty and staff want to attend more ISU sporting events, but financially sometimes aren't able to do so. So this last fall, we discounted a couple of our football games for our faculty and staff, and we are right now rolling out a new faculty and staff punch card that will allow all of you to use it to go to Bengal sporting events at a discounted price.
We also heard your concerns about mail delivery. <laughs> now, at one time, the university had a central office that delivered mail. And during some budget shortfalls, that function went away. Well, first, let's all be honest. That did not save the university any money. It may have saved one department some money, but it shifted that burden to all the rest of you. Now, as a result, your offices had to begin to send people every day to pick up mail, and some departments hired students specifically to go pick up mail on a daily basis. So this was not a budget reduction. This was a budget burden reallocation to the rest of you. <laughs> this is not the way we will do things in the future. So, as soon as we can, and as soon as we will get it up and running, we are reinstating mail delivery for the university. And by the way, as an aside, keep in mind this concept. Budget decisions that are good for one department but they're bad for the university, those aren't good decisions. That's not how we're going to make decisions in the future. We're going to make decisions that are best for our students and best for our university as a whole. And keep that concept in mind because it's going to come up a little bit later in the speech as well. So also when we talked in August, we made a commitment to work together to adopt a faculty constitution. And we have one. So I can do nothing but thank all of you and take no credit for it. All of you, everybody who worked on it, who worked passionately and very hard on that, thank you for your involvement in that project. We will all be better off and benefit from it. Now, as I mentioned in the fall, the FAC codes are now gone. And I want to thank Information Technology Services for making this happen on a timely manner. That was fantastic. And finally, the eye on Red Hill. It's coming back. We have the engineering study in hand, and we're going to begin work on it this spring. And by fall, our students will once again see the eye on Red Hill. Our entire community will see the eye on Red Hill. An important part of our tradition, our history, and our legacy is returning to us. Now, some of these items, they're momentous, like the faculty constitution. And some of them, let's face it, they're minor, like the fact codes. But I hope to all of you they represent a commitment, a commitment I am making to all of you, to all of us, that we are going to work together to make the university a better place for all of us and for all of our students. But in order to do that, we have to get honest and transparent about our finances. So let me say this as we start this part of the discussion. This discussion today is not to justify anything. I'm not here to defend, promote, or endorse any of the budget methods or the allocation decisions or the cost allocations or the spending priorities or decisions that were made that I will present today. I am here to try to make sure the university communicates transparently how things are currently happening. Whether good, bad, or indifferent, what I'm presenting today is what actually is happening. So this next part of the presentation, it's dry, it's no fun, <laughs> there won't necessarily be a test, but it's important for us to all understand this. So we cannot talk about our finances until we talk about where our money comes from as an institution. Now this chart represents the sources of money that come into the university. The primary driver of our revenue, our money at the university, is the state general fund. Add to that the student tuition and student fees. And between those three sources, the state's general fund, student tuition and student fees, it makes up 71% of our entire budget. Now the state general account, this is the money from the taxpayers. 
The taxpayers of the state of Idaho through the legislature give us an annual allocation from the general account to operate. Tuition means the, the fees, the, the tuition that our students pay for their classes, and then on top of their tuition, there are other fees added onto that. At a high level, this represents all of the money that comes into the university. And this next slide, again at a high level, represents where we spend it. Most of our budget, by far, 67% of our entire budget is on personnel costs. We need money to pay all of our people. Now to further break that down, we use our money like this in all of these different areas. And you'll see over on the right, when you combine the direct cost of instruction, plus our student services, our academic support of instruction, our institutional support of instruction, our research and our scholarships, we spend 76% of our total budget on the academic mission. And the remainder is on the support functions that keep the institution and support that academic mission. Now knowing that the combined total of the state general account, that taxpayer funded money, and the student tuition and fees that our students pay us, that that is the bulk of our budget, that that's 71% of what we do. The question is, how do we increase our budget? I'm willing to bet that most everybody watching today would appreciate it if their departmental budget got bigger. So how do we make changes in the budget? Well, given that those three pieces, the general account and the tuition and the fees, make up so large a part of our budget, the key is how do we move that number? Well, there are three primary ways to move that number. First, bring the legislature good ideas that they want to fund. Second, increase the cost to our students. Or three, increase the number of students who pay that tuition. Now, there are other areas and other things we can do. We can increase our fundraising. We can increase our research uh, revenues and other items. And we do need to improve on those, and we will. But there are only three ways to shift that large 71% of the budget. And that is the fastest and most impactful way we can move our budget forward. So let's talk about those three things. First, increasing our appropriations. That's method number one, bringing the legislature a good idea and asking them to fund it for us. For example, this year, one of the light items that we submitted to the State Board of Education was to increase our number of graduates we could produce in occupational therapy. It was a $1.3 million ask from the general account. If the legislature said yes to that, we could get that new money. Now this is the way we have funded several initiatives on this campus. For example, the Polytechnic Institute in Idaho Falls was funded this way. The CPI program, our fantastic career path internship program was funded this way originally. When we make those asks and the legislature says yes, we get the money and then we have to spend the money on that program. It does not give us new flexible money to add to the budget, but it allows us to build programs and expand programs that they agree to fund. So that's one thing we can do, and we do every year ask for money like that. Let's talk about number two, charging our students more money. Well, I'll tell you what I think of that. That is an unfortunately, sometimes a necessity, but it is not a good practice. And it is a practice that I hope everyone in this room and everyone who is watching realizes is an unhealthy business model and one that in the long run is not good for our students. I hope that everyone at the university only looks at the concept of charging students money reluctantly and as a necessary evil and to be avoided when possible. So it leaves us with option three. Option three, increasing our enrollment and retention. Now this particular option comes with a double benefit, and there's a reason. Because not only does the new student or the retained student pay their tuition and fees, but the state also sends us money by what they call the enrollment workload adjustment. Or, as some of you may have heard recently, a discussion around outcomes-based funding. But either way, that means that as we teach our students, as we teach more credit hours and produce more graduates, the state adds more money to the general account to help us teach those students. 
So every new student we get and every student we retain has a double benefit to that part of the budget. The state sends us money to teach them and they pay their tuition and fees. But that also means that if we teach less credit hours and we lose students, the state takes money away from that general account as well. That last point cannot be understated. If we lose enrollments, we not only do not get the tuition that that student pays, but the state can also reduce the general account as well because we're teaching less credit hours. So if we add more students or retain our existing students at a higher rate, we get an increase in both parts of our appropriation. So the conclusion is inescapable. The primary way to raise our budgets at the university is to either add more students or retain the ones we already have. There is no other way that has such a direct and immediate impact on our budget as adding or retaining students. So just so that we are all on the same page, here are our enrollment numbers over the last eight years. As an institution, this is our enrollment trend. And I would put forth that it's not a positive enrollment trend. It's going in the wrong direction. And I think we have heard a lot over the last few years about a decline in our international students. But I want everyone to see the actual data. I want everyone to see where the enrollment declines have occurred. This is our enrollment broken down by both early college and dual enrollment students, international students, and domestic students. If you look at our current international student population, it is roughly the same as it was eight years ago. Yes, it went up and down in between, but right now, it's roughly the same as where it was eight years ago. Now, our dual enrollment and early college students, due to an expansion legislatively of that program, that number is almost triple what it was eight years ago. But that increase in dual enrollment numbers, those students and credit hours we count in dual enrollment and high school programs and early opportunity, has masked, has masked the decline in this number. Our traditional domestic students, that is our real enrollment decline. Now, early college students, it's a fantastic program, and it comes with issues that we will have to deal with as an institution as that program is growing rapidly. But the real issue with regard to the budget, not with regard to other impacts, which we can talk about another time, but with regard to the budget, is the students in this category in early enrollment and dual enrollment account for about one-third the revenue per credit that a d traditional domestic student pays. So while these numbers are growing, everyone that grows grows at about one-third the impact of the budget as students in this category. And this is the category that everyone in the room and everyone watching should care about. Because in addition to those numbers, this is what's happened to our credit hour production over the last seven years. Our credit hour production has declined. Remember, with less credit hours taught, the state also reduces the state appropriation. So we don't get the tuition and fees from the students, and we don't get the money from the state. These are numbers we have no choice but to pay attention to if we want to impact our budget. So, using this credit hour data, understanding how the enrollment workload adjustment works with the state sending us money, taking the credit hours and the amount of the state appropriation and the tuition and fees paid by students, we can arrive at the following chart. This slide represents, by college, it shows the total revenue attributable to each college based on its credit hours and how much of that money we grant back to the college to spend in their budget. So, by way of explanation, if we take the College of Arts and Letters as an example, you're welcome, Candy. <laughs> the College of Arts and Letters brings in and is responsible for about $40 million per year of revenue to the university in terms of all of the classes that they teach, 
And the money that we get from the state and from the students who take those classes totals about $40 million a year in revenue. The university then allocates a budget to the College of Arts and Letters of about $20 million to go do that work. In order to do their job, they get about a $20 million budget. Our current budget model, in our current budget model, there is no correlation between this number and this number. There's no correlation. You'll see that that difference is in every one of the colleges. Oh, by the way, as an aside, we're using last year's numbers. So when it comes to the Division of Health Sciences, although there are now multiple colleges within it, last year it was one budget model. So that's why we're doing it that way still. There's no correlation between the amount of revenue the colleges bring in versus the budget that they use to produce it. Now that alone means we should have a different budget model. Our current module was, model was set up years ago on a base of numbers then and incrementally changed over time. So the net effect of this is this example. Under our current model, if the College of Arts and Letters did something, brought in a whole bunch of new students, retained students, did something that changed their revenue from $40 million a year to 50, let's say, that their revenue went from $40 million a year to $50 million a year, it would reflect no change in this number. Now, it could change, but there's right now not a mechanism built up to recognize that change and have it happen. So that alone means we have to rethink why our budget model has to change, because our current model does not reflect fundamental changes in our core mission and what we do. Now, for everybody who's seen this chart, the first question I assume everybody would ask is, uh, what, pray tell, do we do with the difference? <laughs> I mean, if the College of Arts and Letters is bringing in this and only spending this to do it, what do we do there, 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 etc.? What do we do with the rest of it? Well, that's a good question. Well, what we have to do is fund all of the parts of the university that do not produce revenue. Those administrative areas that are all considered overhead, for lack of a better term, and it's a pretty bad term, I'd like to come up with a better one. But these are the parts of the university we have to operate, but they don't necessarily bring in any revenue. Areas like our HR office, or our payroll office, because, as I understand it, apparently everybody wants me to run payroll every two weeks. <laughs> Well, in order to do that, we have to have resources to do that. The president's office, the provost's office, our landscaping. We love this campus. It's absolutely gorgeous. We have to keep it up. Our student affairs functions, our building maintenance. Every day when you come to work and you go into your building and you want it to be cleaned and maintained and kept up, and this time of year, heated, and in the summer, cooled, so you want us to pay the electric bill and the gas bill to do that. You want us to have an alumni association to keep track of our alumni, to do community relations, to provide campus security and campus Wi-Fi and IT systems. All of those areas have to be funded. And they're funded as areas that don't produce revenue by themselves. So that difference between what the colleges bring in and the colleges spend funds these operations. Now as an aside, just for completeness sake, there are some areas of the university that don't show up on this budget. For example, our auxiliaries. Those parts of the university where we put no appropriated funds. They live only on their own revenues and expenses like student housing or student dining. They get no part of the budget, but I just wanted for completeness sake to note they're not on here, but that's because they're not part of this budget. And now I'm coming to the final two of the budget slides. These are the ones I debated about for a long time whether to put in. I'm going to put them in, but not for shock and not for blame, but because it's about transparency. Again, I'm showing how things actually are. Not how they should be, but how they are. So, if you take the total amount of revenue all the colleges bring in, that top line from a couple slides ago, and you add it all together, and then you subtract from it, all of the budgets that we lined up for all of the colleges, and then you subtract from that all of those overhead costs that we just talked about, 
and not including some of the auxiliaries, as I said, the end result is that we have reached a point as a whole university, when taken as a whole, where we spend more money than we take in. Not by a lot. If you look at the whole scope of an almost $200 million budget, not by a lot, but we now spend more money as an institution than we take in. So think of it this way. Think of it like your household budget. Okay? If as a household, your entire household brings in, let's pick a number, $50,000 a year total, and then from that you have to pay your taxes and you have to pay your mortgage and you've got to pay your electric bills, and you've got to buy food, and then you've got to buy clothes, and you have to live, and you've got to buy gas for your car, and everything that you have to do for your family. And at the end of the year, you have spent $50,500. Then you went $500 deeper into debt that year. And most likely, it's probably on a credit card. I remember, especially when I was at a college and for a long time had little kids, Sometimes I spent more than I brought in, too, and it was on a credit card, and that was not a good idea then. It's not a good idea now, but it happens. Problem is, for a public university, that can't happen because we don't have credit cards. We don't have debt like that, and we're not allowed to. We are a public institution, and we're a public trust with the money we spend, and we have to balance our budget. So we have to fix that. We can't let this happen. So that's something in our budget model and in the way we do our finances, we have to address. Now the last slide. Based on our current allocation methodology for all of those overhead costs that we talked about, when you spread that money across the colleges, it shows that our current methodology doesn't reach a solution that makes sense for the university. The spread of those overhead costs is based on credit hours produced. And the way it, it works or doesn't work pits colleges into haves and have-nots, at least on paper. And that's part of the problem. Okay, so this is the total revenue. It's like the bar chart that I showed you that each college brings in. This is the budget that each college gets back to operate. These are those overhead costs. And how they are spread is based on how many credit hours those colleges produce. So the total amount of the overhead divided by how many credit hours, and it gets allocated to the colleges. It leads to a false impression, and it is false. One could read this and say, well, the College of Arts and Letters lost $3.5 million last year. That's not right, but that's how the allocation would work because of this. Here's something that we all know. The cost to produce a credit hour in English is different than the cost to produce a credit hour in nursing. Those aren't one and the same. But right now, our overhead cost allocation is per credit hour as if they were all the same. So what does this mean? It means that right now, the university needs to have a real conversation about what does it cost us to do business and where do we account for those costs and how do we pay for them. Again, that's a new part of our budget model a new part of our finances that we all have to care about. Because in short, all of this data leads me to this comment. Operating the university on short-term or year-to-year -year basis is not a strategy for growth, and it's not a strategy for improving Idaho State University. It's a pathway to me to low enrollments. It's a pathway to low, intent, low retention. And it's a, more importantly, in this discussion at least, a pathway to budget aggravation. That's the part we should all care about. Now again, the university needs a new budget and financial philosophy. We need one that recognizes the actual realities of the sources of our money and how we use it. Converting to a new budget model is going to be a multi-year undertaking. We have to discuss these, start these discussions soon. It will be inclusive of the whole campus, and we're going to begin to identify budget modeling that we think will work for all of us. And then over time, we will convert to that model. And there are two promises that I can make you regarding this process we will go through. Promise number one, it will be inclusive. Everybody can have a say and be involved. And second, it will mean change, and change that will impact everyone. Now, I know change is hard, 
But change is also necessary because change is also progress. Now, we're done with the budget, but there's one last finance-related issue we have to talk about. Because I've heard this question many times. What about our reserve? What's our carry-forward balance? How much money do we have? Oftentimes called the reserve or carry-forward balance, they're essentially the same. This is a topic I've heard about all across campus. I've heard it from all across the state because I've heard it from leaders in the state in Boise as well. As of this fiscal year, Idaho State University has $82 million of appropriated carry-forward in our reserve. And this is the eight-year trend that got us there. So that means that starting eight years ago, we had about $25 million in our appropriated carry forward, and over time that built up to a current year of $82 million. So that means that for the last eight years, on average, just average, we have not spent about $7 million of the appropriation the legislature gave us each year, leading that number to build up over time. Now, I promised at the beginning of this visit that I wasn't going to tell you I wasn't going to comment on things or defend or decry them. I was just going to tell you how they are. But I am going to comment on this one. For each of the last eight years, we have gone to the state and asked them for more money to do our job. We've told them we don't have enough money to educate our students. And you know what? We were right. We don't have enough money to educate our students. That's a true statement. We need more money to do right by our students. But how we acted after saying that was to not even spend each year the money they sent us to use. On average, we left about $7 million a year on the table. So if you were a legislator, and each year someone came to you and asked you for more money because they did not have enough, but each year they spent $7 million less than you sent them, at what point would you stop believing them? We have to create a strategic, strategic spending plan that reasonably comes up with how we are going to put this money, oops, gone, put that other money that was just there to one-time use. See how quickly it can go away? It always spins faster than you think it would. Now remember, this is our reserve. We are required to keep a certain amount of this reserve for emergencies. So the first thing we have to do is make a strategic decision about how much reserve do we actually need, and then a series of strategic decisions about how we're going to use that money for the benefit of our students. Believe me, we could spend all of this money in a heartbeat. I've seen our needs. I've been here long enough to see our needs. I've seen our campus infrastructure. I've seen our classrooms. I've seen our offices. We could use all of this and still be wanting because I've seen our residence halls. No cursor. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Look at that. Okay. I've seen our classrooms, our offices, our residence halls, our student areas. We could use all of that money and still be wanting. So we have to have a plan. A plan that takes into account our mission, our goals, and what we want to be as an institution going forward. And once we do, we can prioritize and then put some, not all, but some of that money to one-time uses. Because that's also important. Remember, that's one-time money. It's not an annual budget. It's accumulated over time, and we only get to spend it once. And once we spend it, it's gone, and it doesn't get replenished. So we have to come up with, as a campus, a strategic plan to put that money to the advantage and best use of our students. That's the reality. That's what we have to do. We have to come up with a budget and finance model and philosophy that works for us and a way we're going to use our resources for the benefit of our students in a strategic way. So given all of that not good news, where do we go from here? Well, first, we have a lot of work to do. But luckily, we're already getting started. When I started last June, I made a promise to listen to listen to all of you and to build relationships with you. And to that end, I began a listening tour. And I learned about things, lots of things about Idaho State University. I learned from our students. I learned from our faculty. 
I learned from our deans. I learned from our community. I learned from all of you. I heard many of your thoughts about the things we can do to better serve our mission. So this fall, taking some of that knowledge that I had gained, I began assigning some projects to various departments and divisions of the university. These have become known around campus as project charters. Now, a project charter really just means it's an assignment or a task that range from short-term to long-term or multi-year initiatives sometimes that identifies the main stakeholders assigned to oversee completing that project. However, it is the goal that while a particular department may lead that project, all faculty and staff at Idaho State University should collaboratively help move those initiatives forward. So I want to share some of those initiatives with you, but all of them can be found in detail on the President's Office website. First, let me tell you about our Employee Engagement Initiative. I want to ensure that when you come to work, you all have a good experience. I want to ensure that you have an experience that lets you do what you do best and provide you with the support that you need. And I believe that when you are happy and productive in your job, our students will benefit. That's what that project charter is about. Now, part of that effort dealt with dealing with the exception-based time reporting. Now, you all remember what it was. We changed it because every two weeks you had to go in, and if you were a faculty or professional staff, enter a one to show that you didn't do anything, you had to enter something. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what this process told me. What this process told me is we did not trust our employees to enter their time honestly. Well, I changed that. I changed that because we have to trust our employees to do the right thing. So we fixed that. And at the same time, we're changing the way our classified staff report their time as well. But I have to explain the rationale behind it. You see, the state requires that every classified employee report every hour worked. And I want to make sure that every classified employee is compensated for every hour they work. No classified employees should be working unclaimed hours or be asked to work hours without claiming them. We need and need, will have a system for our classified employees to report and be compensated for their hours. Now next, we formed a group to look at our student retention issues. For now, we're calling that group the Academic Success and Retention Task Force. This team will undertake a comprehensive review of the barriers to student success and retention and identify solutions to help our students succeed because we do have a retention problem and we have to look at it. We can do better and we owe that to our students, but we also owe and must not lose our commitment to academic rigor, the integrity of the institution and doing what is best for our students because a student pushed through a class simply for the sake of retention will only make that student ill-equipped to go out in the world and succeed. So we must address this problem, take it head on, and address the problem of retention and the unintended consequences of that focus on retention. Now we've talked also a lot about our budget today. Now among these project charters is the new budget model. Our Vice President for Finance and Business Affairs will take on the work of trying to find that new budget model. We're going to make decisions in the best interest of our students and the university as a whole. Budget decisions good for one department, but not good for the university, will need to be changed. This next project charter I want to talk about. I have asked our newly renamed Office of Equity and Inclusion to reinvigorate our efforts towards diversity. We have an obligation to our students and our campus community to address our campus climate. All people regardless of race, religion, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, or their belief systems should experience a safe, inclusive, and equitable environment at Idaho State University. Now, safe does not mean a promise that no one ever gets offended by an idea or an expression, and we will remain committed to free expression and academic freedom, but we will also address the issues that are present. And beginning this fall, I've asked this group to institute a campus-wide celebration of Indigenous Peoples Day so that we can celebrate and honor the culture and valuable contribution to our community and our campus of the Indigenous Peoples of America. And I have asked our facilities department to take a look at how we do our spaces differently to not renovate spaces without using it every time as an opportunity, 
to use each renovation and each new coat of paint as an opportunity to brand our spaces and create spaces that are relevant to our students. Spaces that are functionally effective to help our students attain their educational goals and also physically create a Bengal environment. And now I have to come in on this slide. Pauline came to me in the middle of the football season. She said, we are going to do a striped section in Holt Arena for an upcoming game. And I said, don't do that. We're not ready for that. That takes time. That takes getting your fan base and your crowd ready and understanding what they have to do and we won't be able to pull it off and it won't work. Well, guess what? Clearly, I was wrong. <laughs> because we did pull it off. And you know what? I am so happy I was wrong because I am so proud of all of us, all of us in Bengal Nation that we pulled that off. Nice job. <laughs> Creating that Bengal environment for all of us and all of our students is what's best for our students. Now these are just a few of our project charters that have been assigned. But I don't tell you about these project charters simply to be transparent, although I'm committed to doing so. I tell you about these so we can work on them together. Many of you in your departments will experience change in how we do business, and change is sometimes difficult. But ultimately, our goal is to improve the student experience and the employee experience. And I believe that these projects will do just that. And let me tell you why I believe that. Because every one of those project charters, when you look at them, I didn't make up any of them. I heard about every one of them from you. Through my coffee with Kevin, through my one thing, through all the listening tours that I went on, through all the conversations that some of us have had, every one of those ideas came from you. Not from me, from you. And so, there's a duty on all of us to become mutually accountable for their success, to make us better. Now again, eliminating fact codes, paint colors, Time reporting, even the eye on Red Hill, those are easy. The real hard work, the real change, that's yet to come. And the only way we're going to do it is together. Together. So how are we going to do it? Well, time for a story. This is one of my favorites. I tell it a lot. Now, many of us know the story of the Wright Brothers. Okay. Two bicycle mechanics from Dayton, Ohio. They used the money from their little bicycle shop to invent powered sustained flight. And on December 17th, 1903, they flew for the first time in history. This pivotal moment in history is captured on film in this photo. That's the same day. You know how you can tell it's that day? Because that day they had to flip a coin to see who flew first, Orville or Wilbur. And Orville won, so he flew, so that's Wilbur. But in order to get the plane off the ground, they had to start back here on these blocks. See the footprints in the sand? That's where Wilbur was holding the wing as he ran by it to help get it off the ground off this rail. That's the first ever human flight. But there's another part of this story. I could talk about this for hours, but I don't think we have hours. But there is one other part of this story, and it starts with this person. That's Charlie Taylor. Anybody ever hear of Charlie Taylor? Usually most people haven't. Charlie Taylor was a bike mechanic, and he worked for the Wright brothers. But he worked for them because he believed in their mission, and he believed in their vision. And when the Wright brothers needed an engine that was light enough to fit on their quite fragile and frankly flimsy airplane, but yet powerful enough to give it the horsepower they needed to fly, they found that no such engine existed. Remember, this is 1903. We all take for granted that we have cars that run on internal combustion engines, but in 1903, those were new. They'd been around less than a decade, and there weren't very many of them. There weren't very many internal combustion engines that even worked. So they needed an engine. They turned to Charlie Taylor. Charlie Taylor actually designed the engine. He was there working because he believed in what they were doing. He believed in their why. He believed in their mission. He was not an automobile designer. He wasn't an engine designer. He wasn't even an engineer. He was a bicycle mechanic. But with nothing but raw pieces of metal, he designed, bent, and cut, 
and fabricated the parts himself, and then he built the engine that they used that very day. He built it from scratch. It was this one right here. That engine built by Charlie Taylor. Charlie Taylor is the guy you've never heard of. But without him and the designing of that engine that was light enough to fit on the plane but with enough power to move it forward, there would never have been an airplane. Charlie Taylor. Charlie Taylor reminds me of us. He reminds me of all of you. Because a lot of really cool things happen at this university, and I've spent the last seven months trying to talk about them everywhere I go, the great things we do at this university. But not a single one of them would happen if it wasn't for each of you every day. Whether you make the newspaper or not, you come in here every day to help us accomplish our mission. If it wasn't for the work you do, none of this would happen here. Now, I tell you all that because everything I talked about today, everything I talked about today, from a budget model to changing our finances to retention and enrollment and all these project charters, everything we need to do to move the university forward is going to require a lot of Charlie Taylors. There's going to be a lot of work to do, and the only way we get through these tasks is together, to do it together. In short, we are going to have to Charlie Taylor the heck out of this university. <laughs> the good news is there are a lot of Charlie Taylors here at this university to do it. For example, Casey Skelton. Casey Skelton in Meridian, without whom our distance learning in Meridian would all go dark. Or how about Stacy Phelan? a UBO who is known for her very customer service orientation and viewed by her colleagues as an absolutely amazing professional. And we're going to need students. Students like the ones who had the courage last week at the Martin Luther King Jr. rally to stand up and tell us about their experiences on campus and in the community and remind us all of the work we have to do to make sure we have a welcoming and inclusive campus for all people. Or for example, we're going to need graduate students like Jared Cantrell, who less than a year ago managed a major project to create the Structures Lab. This effort turned an old warehouse into the premier structural testings lab in the Northwest, used by his faculty mentor, Mustafa Mashal. A project that would have cost the university $500,000 had we bid it out, but instead Jared and his team of students, doing all the work themselves, built the lab in half the time it would have taken for the contractor and did it for one-third of the cost, and on the way, gave our students practical experience. And in that lab now, those students test bridge, bridge structures for the Idaho Department of Transportation, do testing of load structures for the Idaho National Lab, and for precast concrete building companies across the West. And just the very existence of that lab, built by our own students, got one of our undergraduate students, Katie Hogarth, to do undergraduate research with Dr. Mashal to design disaster preparedness and recovery simulations like these for when buildings collapse to help first responders train to save lives when needed. Oh, and by the way, in addition to all that, Katie Hogarth is an honors program student, and in addition to all that, she's the starting goalie on the Bengal soccer team. Because, yes, that's the kind of student we produce at Idaho State University. And we do it because we have dedicated people that teach those students. People like Sine Johnson. Sine, who single-handedly delivers all of our Japanese courses that we offer and mentors every student who seeks a minor in Japanese. And we're going to need people like Ray Hart, the director of facilities in Idaho Falls. If you want to talk to Ray, you better have his cell phone number because he's not in his office. He's out on campus making sure every project is done right. He's seeing to our facility's needs or he's out personally shoveling the snow. Or we're going to need people like Quentin Cohorst, the equipment manager in athletics who epitomizes doing small things with great care, who constantly makes sure our student athletes have the equipment they need to go out and represent all of us as Bengals and make us all proud and so many others, too numerous to list, who every day come in here and find a way to get it done. So many Charlie Taylors, who every day dedicate their time to our students. Together, we can do all of this. 
And as I said last fall, let us not wait for others to call on us to do great deeds. Let us instead be the first to summon the rest to our path. Every one of you is the Charlie Taylor we need. You have my commitment to fixing our budget model, to fixing our enrollment, and our retention, and every one of the other items I talked about today, to moving us forward on our mission for the best interest of our students, and to never forget that a higher education improves people's lives. And that is why we are here. Thank you. Have a great semester. Roar, Bengals, roar.